To begin, I wish to acknowledge that I am speaking on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I was eight years old when I watched the fantastic Kung Fu Western film, Shanghai Noon. For any of you who doesn't, don't know, Shanghai Noon is a buddy cop comedy set in the Old West, where the lead character, uh, Chun Wan, played by Hong Kong film legend Jackie Chan, teams up with Owen Wilson's character, Roy O'Bannon, to save a captured princess. Along the way, we see Chun Wan dressed in classic cowboy attire, shooting guns, riding horses, and getting to, up to all sorts of misadventures. To me, Chun Wan was my hero. Here was a man who represented both sides of my identity as I had grown up on a horse ranch where we bred and trained racehorses in rural Canada. Chun Wan represented both sides of who I was and he helped to romanticize my interpretation of my Chinese heritage, which up until this point, I knew very little about. Growing up, uh, I was the only Asian kid to ever attend my elementary school. Uh, as soon as my Asian heritage came to light, I was instantly placed on an advanced placement program where I was skipped a grade the following year. Pressures were placed upon my shoulders to be that smart Asian kid as, after all, the school district had spent an incomprehensible amount of time elevating me up through the grades. No one stopped to ask if this was what was best for me. I was dubbed Ching Li by my peers, a name that I would not shake until it was replaced by an equally demeaning nickname by a gentleman on a pipeline work camp, Trisket the Rice Cracker. And I have to hand it to them on that one. That one is it's pretty, cl cl pretty clever. This conflating of my identity into something I wasn't is a very common occurrence for people of color in rural communities. And it was something that I embraced because it made me different and unique. Now, allow me to unravel this story about my dear friend, Hassan. Hassan and his family moved to my hometown uh, from London when we were children. Hassan's family is of Sudanese descent, and because of this, they are practicing Muslims. Being a practicing Muslim in rural Canada has its challenges, with none being more profound than this particular story that Hassan tells me of when he and his family were pulled over by two RCMP officers on the side of the road. Hassan tells me about how terrified he and his family were. Terrified for a couple of reasons. The first reason being that uh, Hassan and his family were black immigrants alone on a lonely highway in the frozen north with two RCMP officers. Hassan's mother wore hijab and his brother's name was Mohammed. Hassan tells me about how his brother Mohammed was constantly the focus of people's racial intolerance in our hometown. Mohammed felt un uncomfortable being addressed by his own first name, preferring to be known as Mo. Hassan tells me about how Mo was questioned for an incomprehensible amount of time by these two RCMP officers when he was only 10 years old. This was his reality. Fearing your own first name, being seen out in public and traveling, all of this was a challenge. And now, you might be wondering why I'm telling you this. And don't you worry, we'll get there. Multiculturalism has been the law of the land in Canada for decades. Multiculturalism was first enshrined into Canadian law under Section 27 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Canada and the United States takes two different approaches to how they integrate their new immigrants into their societies. Canada favors the mosaic model, while the United States favors the melting pot model. Can any of you, uh, do any of you, have you ever heard of these terms before? The mosaic model uh, seeks to adhere to the principles that uh, new immigrants should keep their identities intact and become an amalgamation of various cultures, histories, and religious nuances all in one, creating this aforementioned mosaic. The melting pot model 
uh, seeks to, uh, for all new immigrants to remove their identities so as to take on the American identity for themselves. At first glance, the mosaic model appears to be more sensitive to the histories of the immigrants coming into our society. Can any of, but can any of you accurately and uh, think of an example where the mosaic model was a true representation of, of immigrants being integrated into your societies? Is it accurate to say that the mosaic model is being followed in your communities? In the beginning of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, anti-Asian racism was at an all-time high. A recent study by Statistics Canada that was published on May 12th revealed that Asians felt a 30% increase in perceived hate crimes. I myself was the target of people's racial intolerance in my small community in rural, rural Canada. My little brother, who is white, and I were going to get groceries when it happened. A white pickup truck drove in front of the Safeway and rolled down its windows to reveal its occupants. There was two men and one woman. Both of them stuck their heads out of this truck, shouted at me, heckled me, and spoke an incredibly racist rendition of Chinese. A classic. My brother, not knowing what to look for when it comes to these sorts of things, didn't even really understand what was happening until he, we had already gotten inside. Anti-Asian racism is increasing dramatically, and when the pandemic be began, videos flooded social media of Asians being harassed and discriminated against. The Chinatown Lions in Vancouver were defaced not once, but twice. And I won't deny, I was shocked and still am by the events that transpired. It had been years since race had ever really been a thing for me and part of the reason why I moved out of my hometown was it was the easiest way for me to prevent myself from being harassed and demeaned for the color of my skin. Living in international metropolises like Vancouver or Paris, race was never really a deciding factor for who, who I was. That's not to say that racism doesn't exist in places such as this, because it does. It's just not so in your face. The death of George Floyd shocked the world, and anti-racism protests swept the globe. The words, I can't breathe, those words will resonate with me until the day I die. I can't breathe. The words of a man suffocating under the crushing weight of privilege and prejudice. I can't breathe. Coming off the coattails of the incident at Safeway, I saw this as my chance to finally begin making moves and advancing the conversation on race within my community. It was time to start a discussion. The year is 2020 and racism should not exist. It was in the weeks afterwards while helping uh, to lead an anti-racism protest in my community, which was met initially with positive reactions. We had lots of mothers and teachers come to show their support, but we also received pushback. The pushback came in the form of online hatred. It came in the form of hecklers shouting, all lives matter from their lifted pickup trucks as they did nasty burnouts in front of our protest site, but also curiously came in the form of the Confederate flag. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Tristan, the Confederate flag in rural Canada? That's ridiculous. In early July, CBC reported on an anti-racism protest that was occurring in the Okanagan, and it was met with counter-protesters brandishing the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag is a symbol that is very commonly seen in the United States, a prevalent symbol in the Deep South with a history that is steeped in racial prejudice. What if I was to tell you that this symbol is just as prevalent in rural Canada as it is in rural America? This brings me back to my dear friend Hassan. When Hassan first got to, to my high school, he was greeted to a wave of orange and blue. A young teenager had just tragically passed away, and to honor this teenager's memory, baseball caps, t-shirts, and sweaters were all engraved with a symbol of the American Confederacy. 
The tragic death of this young man was not the genesis of the Confederate flag being flown in Canada. The Confederate flag is a common symbol that we see in rural areas. As an immigrant to Canada, these images to Hassan were shocking, if not totally horrifying. He, he, at first, he did not understand what this symbol meant as he was too young. But as he learned about it in school, he was horrified to see that his classmates, teachers, and peers could all fly such a symbol. He asked me, Tristan, what is the difference between this symbol and the swastika flag of Nazi Germany? The only answer that me and him could come up with was that the Nazis primarily targeted European Jews, white people. Hassan's story is but one of many for people of color in rural Canada and highlights disconnect between the ideals of the mosaic model and the model and the way it's actually put into practice. In, in his new home, Hassan felt societal pressures to be the prototypical black kid, one who's outgoing, good at sports, and gets along with everyone. This is not unlike the, the experience that I had when my Asian heritage came to light and I was placed in an advanced placement program. Societal pressures were placed upon my shoulders and Hassan's shoulders that any child is going to struggle to live up to. Now, imagine this. You've immigrated to a new home where the, your new peers place stereotypical societal expectations upon your shoulders. They call you out and they expect you to behave in a way that they think that you should act. All the while, they fly the flag of a group that fought to enslave your people. Now I ask, would you stay and live in such a place? All throughout my childhood, race was the number one thing that caused problems in my in my day-to-day -day life, primarily due to the societal expectations that were placed upon my shoulders due to the color of my skin and the slant of my eyes. It didn't matter that, that I was just a kid and who was placed in this program at a very young age. I didn't get to choose this. It didn't matter that Hassan was a shy kid who was more interested in drama and theater than being that outgoing sports jock. It is here that we truly see the flaws of the mosaic model. The mosaic model thrives in urban centers where communities can form within your own community in rural areas, this model does nothing but create barriers. During my days protesting in my hometown, a, a man drove from a small community an hour away uh, just to bring us coffee and donuts. He pulled me aside and he said, Tristan, have you had any problems with counter protesters? And I said, no. And he said that he had heard rumors of the Proud Boys Appear, wanting to show up at a, another anti-racism protest in a community a few hours south. For anyone who's unaware, the Proud Boys are a white supremacist organization that were founded by a Canadian and hold deep roots both in Canada and the United States. Just like the Confederate flag is flown in Canada, white supremacy exists and thrives here too. I don't have all the answers to these incredibly complex problems. And I wouldn't be standing here on this stage if I did. I'm not a doctor or an engineer. I'm not an entrepreneur or a politician. I am just a 23 year old kid who is tired of having to justify his own self-worth due to the color of his skin and the slant of his eyes. I am just a 23 year old kid who's had enough of carrying around a pocket knife in his pocket out of fear of being assaulted on the street. I am just a 23 year old kid who has had enough. And above all else, I am just a 23 year old Canadian. For people like myself and Hassan, the battle for equality has raged for as long as we can remember. And we wouldn't, I wouldn't be here discussing these issues if this could all be fixed easily.
we have come to a generational reckoning. And it has become clear that, that black, indigenous, and people of color can't do this on their own. We need allies. We need white allies. We need the people who hold that privilege that we crave so dearly to take a stand not just on social media, but from the comforts of our own homes and the privacy of our workplaces. For too long, people have acted as voyeurs to our struggle and have done nothing. We need people to stand up. Just like George Floyd, we are, have been suffocating for far too long. And we need those other three officers to rip that road cop off of our throats. We need people to stand up. Don't let your uncle cry about reverse racism or white genocide at Christmas dinner. Don't let your boss or your colleagues tell that insensitive joke at the water cooler. Call them out and let them know that we see you and we will not tolerate this sort of behavior anymore. The people of this nation, we celebrate the cultures of the world. And as more and more nations unite under the banner of multiculturalism and globalism, Canada serves as an example. An example that unfettered multiculturalism without a plan in place to properly integrate immigrants into our societies, not just in urban centers, but in the small rural communities as well. None of this is going to change. This is a problem that can't just be hidden behind the curtain any longer. The year 2020 is going to go down in history as one of the most tumultuous and uncertain years of the modern era. And as this story is taught to students in schools, which side of this story are you going to be on? Thank you.